back to my YouTube channel. My name is Jacqueline. You can find me over on Instagram and on Ravelry as at Jacqueline Salem. I also post any show notes for any of the things I talk about down in the description box below. So that's where you can find all of that. And if this is your first time watching, welcome. This is a vlog that I post every two weeks with the crafts that I'm working on, usually related to knitting or sewing. There is no knitting this week, by the way, um, only sewing projects. So just a heads up for that. And thank you so much for joining me. As the name of this YouTube channel suggests, I do live in Brooklyn, New York City with my boyfriend and two kitties. And I just got back from a vacation in Cape Cod, Boston, and Salem. It was so fun, so fun. It was just like a very much needed relaxing vacation. Like many of you, I'm sure I have been working from home for the majority of this year. And I guess I just didn't realize how much I needed a vacation until I was just like, oh, so tired all the time. And yeah, I think just being at home so much this year and being surrounded by those comforts and my cats and, you know, having more time uh, to be here instead of like out and about and in the commute and stuff like that. It just took me longer to realize that I needed a vacation and waited way too long to do it. Anyway, moral of the story is we went on the vacation. It was lovely. Um, we did not pack appropriately though. I brought most of my like dresses like this because it's still quite, you know, warm in New York. It's, you know, in the 60s in the mornings and the evenings, but during the day it's still easily in the 70s and low 80s. So it uh, was quite cooler <laughs> up in Massachusetts. And so luckily I had the foresight to just throw in a sweater and a jacket in my bag and I was layering every single day because I was so cold. So did not pack appropriately, but it was still wonderful, wonderful. Cape Cod is beautiful, by the way. I am so jealous of those of you who commented on my Instagram post about it that you live there or go there frequently. It was my first time there. Oh my gosh, Cape Cod National Seashore. The most beautiful beaches I have ever seen in my life, hands down. So, so beautiful. So anyway, that was nice and got back um, just a few days ago. The garden is thriving still. Um, yeah, I checked on everything there and I brought this little, it's a couple days old now, so you'll forgive some of its crispiness, but I did bring back these flowers from my garden, a little bouquet that I made, and yeah, I just love that. So anyway, I hope you guys have been doing well, and I would love to hear from you down in the comments about what you've been doing, especially if you've taken any vacations during COVID, what that has been like for you. We intentionally planned something that we could drive to so we didn't have to deal with airports and that sort of situation. Made lots of reservations for everything in advance. It was a lot of planning for this vacation to make sure that we were still safe and socially distanced from people. So masks everywhere. I, if possible, I think Massachusetts is even more strict about mask wearing than New York, which was great to see. So yeah, it was great. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear if you've taken any vacations. Let me know down below like where you've gone, if it was like weird for COVID and like being out and about. It was like very strange, but yeah, very fun. My cat is trying to, uh-huh. You look very guilty. He's playing in one of my whips that I will show you here in a second. But anyway, let's get into the podcast and I will show you the things that I've been up to. Um, I don't have a ton of things to show you because I've been away for a week, but I have a few things. And the first one is a finished object. So you guys saw this on the last episode as a whip and it is my finished Wixton shift dress, which I just love. Oh, I made it in the most beautiful viscose linen noil, which is just like the MVP fabric find for me this year. I discovered it. Why is it? He only wants to like go crazy and play right when I turn on the camera. He's been sleeping all day and now I guess he hears me talking and he's like so excited to be playing with um, some catnip toys that Cindy sent us. Cindy who watches the podcast. Hello. Anyway, Wixton shift dress. Viscose Linen Noil. This is in the Ruibos colorway from Blackbird Fabrics. My third time purchasing this fabric. It's just such a versatile 
beautiful fabric. Um, it does have linen in the blend, but the viscose in it keeps it from getting too, too wrinkly. Like it is wrinkly, but this is like its natural state. It's been like tossed on the floor, worn like four or five times now. I've been wearing it nonstop. It is such a comfortable, comfortable dress. A great pattern, such a great beginner sewist pattern. So if you are looking, because I get asked this question pretty often, if you are looking for beginner sewing patterns, like you just bought a sewing machine and you're really excited and want to get started, this would be a great pattern for you. So I looked up a definition of shift dresses on Google because as you'll hear in a second, I'm really interested in potentially doing a sew along with you guys for shift dresses. So I just wanted to make sure I had this right. It says a shift dress is a dress in which the cloth falls straight from the shoulders. It can have darts around the bust and it frequently features a high scoop or a boat neck. So from what I can gather, a shift dress just means that there's no waist shaping in the dress. That's essentially kind of what I'm gathering from it because this is called the Wixton shift and there are no bust darts in it, but some shift dresses do have bust darts. But I think what it means really is that there's no waist shaping in the dress. It falls from the shoulders. Um, so that's, I guess, what constitutes a shift dress. And the beautiful thing about shift dresses is that it can or cannot be tied to your waist to give it shaping to your waist if you want to. So in that respect, it's really great for beginners because there's no like super accurate fitting that you have to do to your body and the fitting that it kind of gives you shape is by tying it to your waist with the tie, which I have right here. Uh, so shift dresses, really, really great for beginners. Again, this is the Wixton shift dress by Wixton Patterns. Uh, it features a shirt option, a shorter dress, and then a midi length, which is the one I made here. There are two patch pockets attached to the front, dolman sleeves, which just means that the sleeves are not set into an arm side or a sleeve cap, and it has a back gathered yoke which will kind of give you a new skill. Again, if this is, if you're new to sewing, you can kind of get your feet wet with gathering with it in like a low stakes way. It's very, very simple to do, very simple. One other change that I made to the Wixton shift dress is a fringe hem. So I was debating on Instagram whether or not I wanted to cut this into a mini length or leave it as a midi. 75% of you said midi. So that swayed me a little bit. I was like, oh, maybe this would be better if it was shorter. I'm never sure about my projects as I'm making them. It's only, and even right after I finish them, it's only like a few days after I finish it that I'm like, yeah, I really like that. Are any of you guys like that? I just like never like something while I'm making it. I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Oh, this looks awful on me. Oh, this is never gonna turn out. And then it always works out in the end, but anyway. So I was debating on the mini versus midi length. I did decide to leave it midi, which I just think is like so sophisticated and yeah, it's a great dress. But I did a fringe hem on this. Can you see that? And I love it. It was so simple to do. So, so simple. So the pattern calls to be turned up, I think by like one and a quarter inches or something. So it's like a deep uh, hem as designed. But I really liked the idea of doing a fringe hem because the fabric is this linen blend, so it's kind of already got that casual vibe to it. So I thought it'd be cool to do a fringe hem on it. And all I did was just two lines of stitching, kind of one right on top of the other. And then I took, see if I can find my, oh, it's out there actually, my seam ripper, and then kind of pulled out the cross grain threads until it got to that row of stitching. See if we can show you the stitching up close. So I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see that row of stitching there, but that kind of, that row of stitching is tighter than the weave of the fabric. And it's kind of holding the line of the fringe. So I have this fringe that's about half an inch to three quarters of an inch deep. I could have made a longer fringe if I had sewn it up even more like I, if I wanted a one inch fringe I would have sewn one inch away from um, 
the bottom of the hem and then pulled out the threads for an inch up to it. But I like this kind of shorter, half an inch to three quarters of an inch fringe hem. And I just think it gives it like, it's a really small detail that you probably are not gonna notice unless you're looking up close, but I know it's there and I like it. So yeah, I thought that was a really cute finish technique. So on the previous vlog, I brought up that I was thinking of doing this fringe hem and one of you who watched suggested that I also make a braided belt to go along with it, which like, pff, genius, that's such a great idea. I do have extra fabric. I think that a braided belt would be really cool. So if I cut like lots of little strips and then took them into three braids and kind of braided it down for like a braided belt with a little fringe on the end. Chef's kiss, I think that would look so cute. I really love how this turned out. I think viscose linen noil was the perfect fabric choice for this. The one thing I will say about it, I brought another viscose linen noil dress that I made, is that if I make this again in the same fabric, this is the tie, you can see just how like wrangled and wrinkly this is. Again, it's fine, it's linen, it's not the end of the world, but I'm not gonna be pressing this every time I want to wear it. It's just not gonna happen. So I thought I would bring over from my closet my Kielo dress by Named Clothing, also in viscose linen noil, to show you the straps on here. Same fabric. This has just been freshly washed even, no ironing. And you can see that the tie is so much straighter. I mean, it's still curly, but it's not nearly as like wrinkled up as this one is. And the difference between these two ties, I'm sure the experienced sewists among us will have already spotted the difference or know the difference is interfacing. So this tie right here for the Kielo dress was interfaced. See how straight? This tie was not. And if I do it again in this fabric, which I might, because I love this fabric, as you know, I will definitely interface the tie so that it helps keep its shape. As I mentioned in a previous episode, this, um, this dress does have a lot of positive ease built into the style of the dress. And I'm just not so comfortable wearing something with so much positive ease. I like things to be a little more fitted. So I did size down. Um, I always cut whatever the 36 inch is for the bust and the 41 inch is for the hips. But in this case, I sized down to a size four. So I don't remember, um, I think it was like one, technically one and a half sizes because I always fall across two different sizes, usually one for the bust and one for the hips because I'm a pear shape. So I did size down one size to the size four and I think it fits really, really well. There's definitely plenty of room still left in the hips, so the fit is really, really good. Um, yeah, I really like it. I think it turned out well. One thing I will say that I don't love about this pattern, but it's not something I really know how to fix, so if any of you have suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. I have read that this could happen. It happened to me, too, when making it, because I looked on other people's Instagram posts. When I'm wearing it, I wish I had it on to be able to show you, it has a tendency to want to pull back on me, like the back of the dress is heavier than the front of the dress based on how it's drafted at the shoulder seam. I'm guessing that's why it does that. I don't really know. Or maybe how the scoop of the neck is in the back. I don't know, but whatever the reason, it's like pulling back on me constantly. And I keep having to like shift it down and pull it down. So it's kind of like choking me a little bit, not overly so and not, you know, uncomfortable or anything, but it, it is just like a slight hindrance that I don't don't love. I will still make this pattern again and I like it, but if you have any explanations for why this would be happening, would love to hear your thoughts because it's something I would like to fix in the next iteration of this dress if I can. So again, this is my Wixton shift dress in Blackbird Fabrics, viscose linen, noil. I love it. I love it so much. I have worn it so many times, so hopefully you won't see too many like signs of wear <laughs> on it. But yeah, it's a great pattern. And then now I want to talk about 
a shift dress sew along. So I kind of teased this on Instagram or floated it by you guys to see what you might think. I would really like to do a sew along for any shift dress. So I gave you kind of that description earlier of what exactly constitutes a shift dress. I actually have a pattern right here that I could show you. This McCall's 8030 that I showed you in my last podcast. This I would consider a shift dress. Um, I've heard that people want to make, I don't know if it's pronounced Calle or Cal, K-A-L-L-E by Closet Core Patterns, another great option. Um, the Ultimate Shift Dress from Sew Over It. Really, I'm not that particular about it. I just thought it would be fun to have a sew along and a shift dress is such a great beginner pattern that lots of you guys could get involved if, if you wanted to. So I think it would be just a really fun, simple, sew along for us to do together. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I've already kind of said I'm gonna do it, so it's it's gonna happen and I'm gonna make another shift dress. So if you guys would like to join in with me, that would be amazing. Uh, we're gonna use the hashtag BK shift along on Instagram to kind of cheer each other on and show our projects to each other. Please tag me in any posts that you make about it so I can see what you're up to, your fabric choices. Uh, your pattern choices, and if it resembles a shift dress in some way, it's it's good with me. I'm really not that particular about this. I just like having some community and a little sew along. So I hope you will join. Uh, the official start date is going to be October 1st, which is like coming up. Yeah, it's September 28th. I talked about it on Instagram a couple weeks ago, but no hard finished deadline set yet. You know, just kind of gather our materials, let's gather the patterns. I, again, would definitely recommend the Wixton shift dress, but there are so many shift dress patterns out there. Use what's in your stash, uh, use a pattern that you've always wanted to make, you know, whatever you want to do is totally fine with me. So I hope you will join in on the BK shift along and let's do it. Okay, so I have two works in progress. Um, one of them you've seen before, and another one you will only have seen if you are a patron over on Patreon. By the way, I do have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Jacqueline Salem. I post two times a week, every Tuesday and Friday, and it's just all this bonus content that I don't share in other places, a lot of photo essays, things about Brooklyn and living in New York life in general, um, project updates, things of that nature, really recipes all the stuff. So this dress, I showed it to you guys in the last episode complaining about facings. Thank you so much for all of your feedback, especially in regards to understitching, which I did. And it seemed to have worked. And then I came back home after Cape Cod and you can see it's still trying to flip up on me. It's not the worst thing, but you can see it. You can still see it in the back. Like it's like waving on the neckline. When it's on the body, it's not quite so obvious, but it is still trying to pull out at the neckline around the front. So I don't really know what to do about it. The understitching definitely helped. Understitching is where, by the way, I'll show you, is a line of stitching see if we can get a focus here, is a line of stitching right here that is, gets stitched to the seam allowance. So the seam allowance kind of pulls it in. You don't see it from the outside. You stitch right, you stitch right on the inside of the facing and the seam allowance. So you kind of open it up like this on your sewing machine and then stitch, 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 stitch all the way around. So then you don't see it from the outside, but that seam allowance kind of pulls it down to the dress instead of trying to pop out constantly. That did help tremendously from before, but it's, it's still trying to do it. So I don't, I don't really know what to do about it. Again, it's not like the end of the world. It's not super, super noticeable when the dress is on. I'm not gonna concern myself with it too much, but I still have other issues with this dress. I haven't, the only thing I haven't done yet is hemmed it. That's really all I need to do. And I think I will like it a little, I'll like it a little more when it's shorter, but I'm also considering making the sleeves shorter too. There's just something about this. 
maybe it's just the fabric. I don't know. It's a really loud print for me. I don't normally wear prints that are like this graphic and bold. It's a very high contrast print. Something about the gathered sleeve cap with the longer sleeves on it has just given me like 80s vibes and like not in a cute way. I don't know. I just keep hesitating about it. It's been sitting in my sewing room for a while now on the hanger of like places where I hang in progress dresses to be finished. And I'm just like not, it will take me no time at all to finish this hem. And it's also like got the advantage that this is one of Andrew's favorite patterns that I make, like my first version of the Etoile dress. By the way, this is the Etoile dress by French Poetry Patterns. Um, it's his favorite dress, so you would think that would motivate me more to finish it, but there's just something about, something about it that just doesn't feel like me quite yet. And I love this pattern. This is like my fourth or fifth time using this pattern. It's not the pattern. It's something to, to do with this fabric and pattern match. Again, it's a bold print, so I thought fun flirty dress would be great for it. I'm still... I still think it is a great pattern and fabric match. The fabric itself is a wonderful match for this kind of pattern. It's a, a rayon crepe fabric from Blackbird Fabrics. But for some reason, I'm just like not in a mood to like finish it. It's just a hem. So I hope I wear it. I hope by hemming it into like a mini, uh, mini length. It's already like a mini length. And by the way, when I talk about, like, I frequently do polls on Instagram, like, should I make this mini or leave it midi, like I did for my Wixton shift dress? I don't mean mini, like, up in my crotch mini. I mean, like, like mid-thigh. Like, I still want to be able to wear everything that I make to the office, so it needs to be appropriate to wear for an office environment because I like to get a lot of use out of my clothing. So when I say mini, I don't mean, like, ultra short. I just mean, like mid-thigh-ish. So anyway, I'm hoping when I hem this to be a mini length, I'll like it a little bit more. Maybe if I make that shorter, maybe I'll be more excited to wear it. I don't know. I don't know. But these coconut choir buttons, I think, are just adorable. I think the fabric is really cute. It's just like I said, it's a really bold graphic print for me. It's not something I normally go for. My next project is a bit of a special one. So you may recall, if you have been watching this YouTube channel for some time, in 2017, I took on an insane project where I sewed four quilts in one and a half months. You heard that right. Four quilts in one and a half months. It was insane. Needless to say, that was three years ago, and I haven't sewn a quilt since. And just to give some context, I love making quilts. I've been sewing quilts since single digits age. That's what my uh, grandmother, my mama, who I inherited this machine from, that's what she um, introduced me to sewing with was through quilts and she loved quilting. It's just like a really heritage craft for me. And I love them, but four quilts in one and a half months was a bit of a burnout. And I haven't sewn one since until now. So this is a really special project for me. My boyfriend's sister is getting married and I thought what better gift to give them than a quilt. So Katie, if you are watching this, I don't think you are, but if you are, stop watching and you'll receive it soon enough. Now you know what it is, I guess, if you're watching, but stop watching <laughs> so I can show it off here. So some time ago, about a year ago or so, Katie, my boyfriend's sister, she showed me this rug from CB2 that she loved. I'll make sure to pop in a photo of it. It's a rainbow rug. Katie loves anything rainbow. It's like her thing. Luckily, her fiance loves it too because um, it's a very specific aesthetic, but she loves rainbow and she loved this rug, but this rug was like $1,200 or some, something pretty expensive. And so she decided not to get it, but fell in love with it. It was like the one, but she, she didn't get it. And I just kind of like filed that away for future 
use or future knowledge. I did not purchase her a rug, but I thought I could make her a quilt based on this rug. So if you are a patron, you will have already seen this on previous vlogs um, earlier this year, but I have made significant progress on this project and here it, it is. It's gonna be kind of hard to show because quilts are enormous. It's like not very wide. It's like maybe about like the width of a twin size bed, I would say. But it's a design that I kind of, well not made up, but it's based off of the rug. It has all these different angles that I just kind of had to self draft and eyeball it. So it was a bit of a process kind of making the design. I'll show you the other end too. Sorry, don't want to hold out on you. Um, it was a bit of a process designing this. I first pulled the image of the rug into Adobe Illustrator and then kind of comped up a design based on that, figured out some of the angles and some of that to cut the pieces, went shopping at Joanne for the fabric. Here's all the beautiful rainbow of fabric that was really fun and just picked colors that were as close as possible to the rainbow colors in this rug and then from there kind of laid them out on my enormous dining room table which was such a huge help and just kind of like shifted the angles until it all looked right cut it out and then it was the size that it was going to be i tried to make it as big as i could with the fabric that i had also keeping in mind that i have to like work with the width of the fabric too that was going to kind of affect it anyway it was a bit of a mind-boggling project but here we are um the top is now quilted with the batting and the backing the backing is just a sheet this is one of my tried and true ways of making or finding backing fabric on the cheap because quilt backings can cost a significant amount of money because you're looking at like for a queen size um, quilt something in the realm of like you know seven or eight yards at least so it can be quite expensive so sheets are like my go-to for quilt backings because they have a standard size that is usually going to fit whatever quilt top that you construct so I ordered this kind of gray sheet and then the batting is actually a poly poly blend batting which I don't recommend my favorite is actually the warm and natural um, cotton battings I would definitely recommend 100% cotton 100% wool any kind of natural fibers for your batting the batting is the piece that goes in between the quilt top and the quilt backing that's what kind of gives it the weight and the warmth so when you have something think of it I guess like acrylic yarn versus wool yarn wool yarn is going to produce a much warmer sweater whereas acrylic yarn sweaters are not going to be as warm but of course the upside is it's cheaper so whenever I was making those four quilts I didn't have the budget to be buying four natural fiber quilt batting so I bought a huge roll from fabric.com of like a poly and cotton blend so I still have quite a bit of that left over I'm going to use that up wherever I can. And so that's what I've been doing for this quilt. At first, I thought, as far as like the actual quilting, you can see that it's quilted in some areas and some not. Um, I did pin baste for the first time. Normally I'm a spray baster if I even quilt the quilt myself at all. To be honest, I'm a big, I love sewing the quilt top. That's my favorite part. So in the past, Normally I just sew the quilt top and then buy the batting and the backing and ship it off to a family friend who does a lot of the actual quilting like oh she is an artist I just love her work so most of the time I just send it off to somebody else to do the quilting because I don't really have the like knowledge know-how tools to do any kind of fancy quilting so when I'm quilting anything it's usually just like straight lines quilting in the ditch which just means quilting like in the seams. That's what quilting in the ditch is. By the way, if you're interested in sewing quilts, the Brooklyn Knit Folk Quilt Along series. I have a whole playlist on YouTube for free, 10 part series that teaches you how to sew a quilt. It is another one of those like 
just bought my sewing machine, cracking open the box for the first time. What the heck do I make? It is the perfect first project. Perfect first project. So that's there if you need it. But this is one of those times where I was trying something new with the quilting. I ba or pin basted it with safety pins as opposed to spray basting it, which is my normal way. And I have to say the pin basting took like four times the time that it took to do spray basting. Spray basting is just so much faster for me. I can't honestly argue that it was any less accurate than the pin basting, but like I said, I don't do a ton of quilting. I mostly just sew the quilt tops. So this is kind of my first time doing anything fancy with the quilting. And when I pieced it together, I first stitched in the ditch for all of the various pieces. And then I was like, well, what should I do in the various sections? Should I do anything special? I thought what I would do is just kind of follow the natural direction that the pattern was going in. So for example, we have like a triangle piece on the top here. So I sewed from the triangle and then same for this red section, sewing from the triangle, from the yellow. And then I tried it with sections that go all the way across like this orange one and tried it with this gray one, which still has a few rows of stitching left in it from where I didn't pull it out. And it just looked bad. It didn't look good. For some reason, the quilting really only worked out whenever I was doing it from a triangular piece. I don't know why. If experienced quilters have any thoughts on that, definitely feel free to add them in the comments below. But I ended up unpicking the stitching from any of the rectangular pieces where it was just straight across because it just wasn't it wasn't looking good and decided to only do quilting in the sections that are triangular and it actually worked out because the triangles are kind of evenly dispersed throughout the quilt and then that teal one right there so they're kind of like it's evenly dispersed throughout and it just looks really cool i'm going to try to take a photo of it on the floor and insert that picture of it for you here so you can see the full quilt in all of its glory but oh i'm just so excited about it i think she's really gonna love it um yesterday when i was doing some of the quilting on the parallelogram or rectangular like sections i was having some doubts like oh what if she what if she hates this? What if this isn't good enough of a present? I don't, I don't know, because it was just not looking as polished as I wanted it to. But once I ripped out that stitching in this kind of orange section and any of the sections that span from one side all the way to the other, it worked out just fine. So now I'm really pleased with it. I finished all of the quilting. I have trimmed my excess. And now I will start the binding process. And normally I'm a proponent of hand binding your quilts. I think you really get the time, you get what you put in for it with the time. Hand, hand binding it just looks so nice. I might still do that. It just takes so long and I don't know. I just really would like to finish this project because it's been a whip for quite some time now. Um, definitely since the beginning of this year, which is a long time for me in quilts. Like I said, if I can finish four quilts in a one and a half month span, I should have this should have been finished a long time ago. But of course their wedding got postponed because of coronavirus. So I didn't really, really wasn't on a timeline to sew it anymore because it got postponed to next year. But I figured I'll go ahead and pull it out and finish it. And I'm so glad that I did because I just think it's such a fun, colorful piece. Mina, if you're watching this, Knitting Expat, I'm sure you would love this quilt and I can't say I wish I had a pattern for you again all I have is just the photo of the CB2 rug so if you're like me and can kind of draft your own patterns based off of ideas in your head then I say go for it because it was really really fun so this is my rug wedding present uh, work in progress designed out of a CB2 rainbow rug for my boyfriend's sister and her new fiance. I hope they will love it. I can't wait to give it to them. I do need to, like I said, bind it. And then I also want to add like a little signature panel to it with um, their names and their wedding date. They eloped, by the way. They're still going to have their wedding next year, but they eloped. So that's why I wanted to go ahead and get this finished for them. Okay. 
Okay, so that is it for all of the making today. I do have a few acquisitions that I wanted to share with you. I'm not sure if I mentioned this on previous episodes or not, but my fabric stash is truly dwindling down. I have one, sort of two, I guess two, two more dress quantities of fabric left in my stash. And fabric does take quite a bit of time to get here, especially from Blackbird because they're in Canada and so their shipping times are a little bit longer. And fabric.com, I'm not sure if they are back to their normal shipping times, but their shipping lead time at the beginning of kind of quarantine for coronavirus was like a month. So it's time to start ordering some fabric. So I have been doing that slowly but surely, buying patterns to kind of plan with them. So I wanna show you two fabrics that came in from Blackbird Fabrics. This is one of my orders. This is a tensil twill from Blackbird Fabrics in the rosewood color. This has a very specific purpose. So if you've been watching the podcast recently, you will know I love the cami skirt. The cami skirt is a pattern designed by the hemming. I have made two. This is my first one. This is the one I just finished a couple weeks ago. This is probably my most worn me made item in my wardrobe. I love this skirt so much, but as you can see, this color is a little bit faded. I made this over a year ago now. It sees so much wear. Um, so I decided to buy a backup fabric. It's kind of hard to tell actually. It doesn't even look like it's that worn yet from this, but I went ahead and bought a backup fabric just because I wear this so much. I wanted to have a backup fabric in my stash of the same color so that I could remake this exact skirt uh, once it becomes too faded to look nice. So this has several, several years, I think of at least two years of wear left on it, hopefully. And then once that day comes, I have the backup fabric to make another. I just wanted to make sure because again, I wear this so often, it would just be a shame to not have the fabric to make it in that exact color because I wear it so often. And then the next fabric, so my light blue textured tensil viscose dress square neckline with the ties on the top that I showed you in my previous episode. Uh, I took amazing photos of it on the Brooklyn Bridge. It is such a great occasion fabric and so silky and so soft. So I went ahead and ordered some in white and I have been scouring and sourcing and asking you guys for pattern suggestions to sort of not mimic, but like use as an inspiration this dress from a company called Doin. They have this dress that I have been in love with. I believe it's called the Valencia dress. It's so, so beautiful, ethereal, romantic, just like all of my normal vibes that I like in clothing these days. And I've been searching for patterns to mimic it. This one you've already seen if you've been watching the podcast. This is a vintage McCall's 7981. It is no longer in print by Laura Ashley collaboration. It was very difficult to track down, but I love that top. And I think I could use this bodice in whatever dress I kind of dream up to kind of mimic or be inspired by this Doan dress. But then somebody, I'm sorry, I don't know your exact names or usernames. Somebody also suggested another Laura Ashley pattern, McCall's M5619. And this one I think is even more perfect, even more perfect, especially that bodice piece. I think I would lengthen it just a little bit so it's not so umpire waisted. So I would lengthen it to my natural waist and then add the skirt on top of it. No sleeves, probably. I'll just leave off the sleeves and finish it like a uh, sleeveless dress, sort of like this one. So yeah, I just didn't have really any patterns in my stash that had gathering in the bust area like my inspiration did. And gathering is still one of those things that's like, it makes sense to me when I'm adding something like a gathered tier to a skirt, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me yet for like how to draft stuff for a bodice. I don't know. So I just felt like I'd be more comfortable if I had a pattern to kind of work with. So that's what I picked up there. So this is the fabric I'm going to use for that in conjunction with, just wait till you see it, wait till you see it. This amazing floral applique lace. 
So I've spoken about this, but I don't think I've shown it to you. This was on deep clearance from fabric.com. I don't even know if they sell this anymore. If it if they do, I will put a link in the description box for you, of course. I don't even know if they sell this, but it is amazing. And I'm going to use these together in some sort of ethereal romantic dress. So the one thing I have to be, you know, cognizant of, and I've brought this up on previous uh, vlogs, I don't want it to look like a wedding dress and it's very wedding dressy just like looking at this fabric. So I think the way that I'm going to have to, I'm just going to have to think of ways with the pattern that I can make it as casual as possible in the pattern with this super elevated fabric. So hopefully I can pull this off. Um, if you guys have any thoughts about that, please leave them in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. But yeah, so I'm gonna, because the fabrics are so occasion wear and so elevated, I'm definitely gonna have to make sure that the pattern and the design of the dress balances that out in some way. So this can't be a maxi length dress for one because it would just be like scream wedding dress. So I'm thinking at least maybe a midi length dress, which may still scream wedding dress. I don't know. And who, you know, maybe who cares? if it does anyway, it's not like the end of the world, but I, do, I just wanna be able to wear it too without like feeling self-conscious. And I wear dress up things all the time, so I'd rather be overdressed than underdressed to be honest, but yeah, I just wanna make sure I don't give like, I'm not like making a wedding dress. But I love these two together. Look at this. Is this applique lace like not the most beautiful? Ugh so so excited about this so those are my acquisitions for this episode um i have a couple other like little things rolling around that i want to do but they're not part of knitting and sewing but i figured i'd show you anyway so while i was at um cape cod we biked the rail trail beautiful miles and miles of amazing paved biking and walking running trails and then while we were on this trail, I stopped and picked up a lot of fallen pine cones. And I have, you know, a good, a good few of them. I don't know, about like 10 or so in varying shapes and sizes. And I want to make just like a little pine cone garland to hang over my uh, fireplace in our living room. And I also collected these fallen leaves. We have a tree right outside our front door here in Brooklyn and it's shedding the most gorgeous yellow leaves right now. So I picked up a bunch of the prettiest ones and I want to make a little fall garland because it's fall. Happy fall, y'all. So yeah, I just think that'll be really cute. So I'll have my little leaf garland and my little pine cone garland and I'm probably going to document that and put that over on Patreon. So again, if you are interested in supporting this channel and want more content you can head over there and that's really it for the episode today thank you so much for watching i hope you guys are having a great start to your fall would love to know what projects you are working on right now and i will see you in the next episode bye